take risk to you know or the discussion this capacity um, so this is our our equations for the capacity the area times the build speed times the material density now to determine this area it's actually the area if we draw it in the in the front view then this will be our area so we have a trapezoidal area so let's say this is going to be a1 and then we have another area for this uh, let's say this this circular area okay so let's say it's a okay so meaning you have to determine this area and then if you have the bell speed and multiply that to the internal density the mass capacity okay so the computation for area you can just refer to the SEMA handbook but in our case here since we are going to deal with the signs then that's going to be different because that the sign uh, you are you are given this this one is given and this one is also but you don't have the area this, uh, this area is the, this one is the, the velocity is also the question mark like now you can also assume this to obtain the uh, area Again, when you do assumptions, then you have to refer to burning codes, codes or standards. Now, the question is, why do we need to solve for the area? That's because in this area, we can we can determine. So that's the, the your uh, what's given is the amount or the loadings, and you have to give the geometry. Whereas for for analysis type of problem, you have the geometry and uh, details, and then you can just solve for the loadings. Okay, so we need this area so that we can determine the boundary. However, if you have this cross section, this area is a circular area, and this is a area. So this one is a two, is a this one is a two. But when we say Help me, it refers to this perimeter. Okay, that's our belt width B, but our effective width should be only from, from where the material is touching the belt. And we can just say it's, or we can just denote it as small letter B. Okay, so the problem with this is you have to determine also other details like for example the height. It's going to be the height of this. Right? And also this one. I don't know. But the point here is if you solve for area, then it will bring you back to more and more. High, so you can't actually mean, probably it would be harder to solve. By the way, the distance from this point to this edge is probably edge distance. Okay, so that's why I find out or I realized that it makes sense to refer to 
tables. Tables and graphs. Uh, provided by the by the standards or codes. Okay, so again, um, it is very practical if you can just uh, or if there's um, tables or graphs available in, this, uh, in the codes and standards, rather than just going for the equations okay because after all after all the computations they're still i mean we're actually computing a range we're not actually computing an exact value so we're still playing within the range okay so that's the actual essence of design okay so now let's go uh, go into the table provided the handle okay, so you have this table for dash two and that's actually four dash two to four, I think four, four dash three. I mean four, four dash five or four dash, dash six in the next pages. But um, if you notice here, we have twenty degree trough belt, three equal rolls, standard edge distance, and uh, we have this equation. And it means that this table will only work for 20 degree trough belt. And if you have a different trough angle, let's say 25 degrees or 30 degrees, then you have to refer to the, uh, to the corresponding table. So that's maybe 4-3 or 4-4, uh, I don't know, you just have to check it. Okay, so now in this table, you will see here you have a capacity at 100 FBM. Later on, we will we will discuss this. But take note, this is capacity. That's the given capacity. This one, in case of the design problem. Except that um, we have to multiply it, and this is not just actually the capacity. It's actually Capacity. So we have to multiply that to 100 FPM, that's root per meter divided by our actual speed or our selected speed. So once you have this, and you have also, I mean, you can also obtain your surcharge angle because depending upon the material, you, you'll be able to determine this surcharge angle okay so for example if you have a material that has a 15 degrees surcharge angle and you computed your equivalent capacity let's see this one now what's going to be our belt width in inches okay so you can uh, uh, i mean you can right away obtain your belt width that's in inches and this one you can also obtain your um, cross-section of the load so 15 and that's gonna be this one okay so why would we need this kind of cross-section if we have already uh, the I mean if we already have this belt width so maybe for just checking the capacity the actual capacity Okay, so that's it. Okay, so now let's get into the detail of this equivalent capacity. If we can write the notation, the equivalent capacity, we'll just use the symbol C sub D for equivalent capacity. It's just equal to C sub M, the mass capacity required. Okay, times 100 foot per minute divided by the actual speed. Well, or selected, I guess this is, uh, this is selected. selected. Okay, so.
By the way, uh, I guess it's not the mass capacity. That's the capacity of 100 FPM. And the unit is So I guess this should be the volumetric capacity. So, uh, so again, this is just CV required, which is just the to the mass capacity times the reciprocal of the density okay, so this is just the equation of that to convert the volumetric capacity to mass capacity okay now the question is what is the actual bell speed how how do we know if this will be our uh, i mean how do we know what will be our actual belt speed or selected belt speed okay because design actually you don't have this you don't have this you don't also have the the intersectional error so there is a table table 4-1 and it says recommended maximum belt speeds okay so take note it's just the maximum belt speeds and it says here uh, on the first column, you have the number of being conveyed. So you have to select first which uh, which one is your material. Is it a green or other free-flowing non-abrasive material, or is it a non-abrasive materials discharged from belt by means of blouse or scrapers, or is it you know, feeder belt, uh, flat or trough, or for feeding fine. A fine non abrasive or multi abrasive materials from hoppers and beads. Okay, so, of course, you have to select the, the material and then you have these belt speeds. So for example, for green and other free flow non abrasive materials, we have, for example, we have 500 uh, FBM feet per minute, and we have this also uh, at what uh, belt width? So, it says here 80. 80 inches but you also have a belt width here right you have a belt width so I guess maybe just my assumption that probably the iterations so first we have to select for example uh, this is our our material and we'll select 500 uh, FPM and then we'll solve for the equivalent capacity and once we solve this and so and go into the table and select our belt width right so if this belt width is greater than our our selected uh i mean our belt width corresponding to our selected belt speed then i guess we have to change okay so that's just my uh my assumption okay so so for the belt width we have standard belt widths uh, based on the Now let's go on to the lump size. A lump size, if you recall, that this also affects the design or selection um, for the screw conveyors, and this also affects here in in belt conveyors. And there is actually a table and a graph in the SEMA handbook, but um, I guess. I guess we'll just have to to adopt the uh, the equations rather than the graphical values. Okay, so it says there it's actually written in uh, in words, but if you if you 
convert that in a table you can just write it something like this so you have here a 10% lumps and 90% lines okay, so lumps so that's just like the big, big size of the material so if we have 10% lumps and 90% fines at 20 degrees uh, surcharge angle the maximum lab size would be B all over B okay so the belt width and for 30 degrees surcharge angle this case if you have all lumps no fines then we have B over 5 this one is B of 10 okay so this is how I interpreted the uh, the wordings in the, in the handbook okay and again there's there's a, a graph where you can also obtain the maximum lump size by entering into the All right, now let's talk about the pulley diameter and face width. Okay, so this is our pulley, this is our shaft. When, when we say pulley diameter, this is it. Uh, we, we can just write maybe D sub B. And then when we say pulley face width, this is the length of the pulley. Okay, so let's just say D sub W. Okay, so for the diameter, we have standard for standard steel drum, steel drum pulley. We have uh, 6 to 20 inches at 2 inches increment. So, meaning we have 6, 8, 10, 12 till 20 inches diameter. So, we can have that. Also, 24 to 60 okay, at 6 inches increments. So, that's 24. Then plus 6 so that's gonna be 30 and 36 uh, 42 something like that and for wing pulley diameters we have 8 to 20 at uh, 2 inches increment we also have 24 to 36 at uh, 6 inches increments Now for the belt, uh, the belt width, the face width, fully face width, we have this. So if our uh, if our belt is up to 42 inches, then meaning our our Fully face width is just simply the belt width plus two inches. But if we have 42 inches and greater, we have B. That's the belt width plus three inches. Okay, so it's just the same as what we did in in the bucket elevator designs. That if this is our belt belt width. Then we have actually an um, an allowance here. Okay, um, but this one we we'll, we will adopt the SEMA specifications for the face width, and it says again the belt width plus two inches. So meaning if we have uh, two space uh, two spacings right here, uh, this side and on this side, then meaning we have one inch and then one inch. Okay. 
Okay, so now let's move on to the um, horsepower requirement. Okay, power requirement. So we have actually the SEMA horsepower formula, and it says, uh, and it states, or it is expressed something like this: the horsepower is just equal to the um, tension effective tension times the belt velocity all over 33,000 okay so this one is the effective tension in pounds and then this one is the velocity velocity in I guess this is in feet per minute and then this one will be the conversion factors and you get this okay so basically this effective belt pool is just the total forces required to uh, forces to overcome friction um, what else the forces required to lift to lift or lower the material being transported and then forces to accelerate the material with the material okay so in mathematical expression it is expressed as d sub b is equal to l times k sub d a lot of factors where you can just find this in the table of gra or graphs or equations provided in the handbook. So one five k okay, plus. Okay, so it's actually a lengthy. Uh, it's actually a lengthy equations, and for us here, since we don't have much time, then we'll just adopt the graphical method graphical method and by the way this is in chapter 6 okay so the graphical method is is basically can be expressed as H should be total is simply the horsepower uh, to overcome the friction so that's HP sub F plus the horsepower required to lift the material plus the horsepower to uh, convey the material horizontally. Okay, so this one is the frictional horsepower. And then this one, the HP to lift the material. Then this one is HP to convey the material horizontally okay so for the frictional horsepower you have to enter the the, the chart and that's the chart uh, figure 6.17 okay so figure 6.17 okay so in this charts it says um, in the x-axis that's the horizontal centers so that's along the the horizontal and we have here on the vertical axis the horsepower to drive an uh, empty conveyor for each 100 uh, fpm belt speed okay okay so we have this um, diagonal lines also we have the pounds per linear foot that's actually the weight of the idlers um, and also the the weight that the dead weight of the belt and other mechanical parts okay so so you have to um, determine that by entering into this table and in this table you have here the belt width that's the belt width 
and here your material density okay so that's the material density and then you just have to select uh, which one be your value for the for the pounds per linear foot of these uh, of these mechanical components okay however it's just a uh, the values are for 50 100 150 and 200 um, density material density and if you have I mean this is our material density you can uh, read that in, in the handbook except that this material density I'm not sure if this is the belt material or the Guess this is the the product density, like the grains or whatever material. Okay, so so if you have a material density that's uh, that's not within the range of the um, the tabulated ones, if it's not fifty or one hundred or one fifty and two hundred, then you have to do. Uh, I guess. Okay. Again, this is just my opinion. I guess you might have to to do interpolations or extrapolations. Okay, but to get away with that, I found a reference also. Uh, yeah, unit operations by these authors, and they have this information right here in page fifty-eight. They have. Um, says here approximate weights of conveyor and it says here we have five conveyors uh, I guess that's the screw conveyors but here we have belt conveyors and it says here one uh, one pound per inch of width per per foot okay so I guess th that's just the same but also it it specifies here that actual dimensions and widths are available in manufacturer's catalogs. Uh, since this is, this is just a, a classroom setting, then we'll just use this for now. The belt conveyors, one pound per inch of width per running foot. Okay, so we'll write it here. One pound per inch of width per foot. Okay, so this is our uh, handy equation. Okay, so now when uh, once you have that, once you have this value, let's say you ha you have obtained a value of uh, let's say f fifty, for example. So this is your linear foot, uh, pounds per linear foot, and then you start with a horizontal center along the x-axis let's say we have 1400 so you project it upward then from that intersection then you project to the vertical axis uh, that can be in, uh, along the left or along the right and let's say you have this four point for example we have 4.8 uh, 4.8 horsepower then it says here that the value, the horsepower you, you obtain here must be multiplied to the belt speed divided by 100. So we need that the efficient horsepower is 4.8 times the belt speed, your actual belt speed divided by the 100. Okay, so that's it. Okay, um... Now, in the next video, we will continue our discussion regarding this uh, horsepower for the belts. And we will discuss an, uh, another portion of the horsepower, which is the horsepower to lift the material and then horsepower to convey the material horizontally.